the two bits of advice that I got that were super powerful to hear them was one is like you said, you know, when you're home, you're home. Um, and knowing that, like knowing that there are plenty of Shabbos meals that nobody that want. And, and I, and I got the line of, please, can you have, and we kept it just the family or there's mm. plenty of days or plenty of times where a father has to just say, I know I could, but I really need to be here. Right. And the second thing is really to give your kids the, the veto power on what you do mm. or your, or your wife, wow. I mean, mostly your wife, not really your kids. Right. So. And that, that's that's a really big deal. Once the, once the family knows they can veto it, you're going somewhere, they can say no, they have power. And when they have power, they feel responsible. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to say a major thank you to Charlie Harari for joining us today. It's really such a pleasure to have you on. Someone who has inspired me so many times, someone who inspires so, so many people on really on a daily basis. Really appreciate you taking the time. Baruch Hashem. Thank you so much for your kind words. And it's an honor to be with you. And thanks for the opportunity. What do you think it was that got you to where you are today? You know, like you, you're such a unique personality in the Jewish world. Like what, what would you say it is? I don't know where I am. Meaning I, I, I don't have a destination. I, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, do as, as, as good as I can every day with Hashem's help. But when I was younger, being able to be involved in certain programs had a big influence on me, mm. and TSY in particular. Individuals who took the time to uh, be there for me, Moshe Bain in particular, mm. um, Steve Savitsky, others, Rabbi Butler. There were, there were some people when I started my career in law, and I was told by some people, believe it or not, that I was out. Meaning I was uh -huh. given, the, the advice that I was given as a kid, and when I mean a kid, I mean when I was in law school, so I wasn't really a kid, but you know, the advice was you have a choice, right? Either you go into Chinuch, or a bonus, and then you serve Hashem, or you go into law and you sell out, like literally, <laughs> like it was like that. Wow. Um, I remember clearly speaking to one individual who was then the head of a major organization, and like he gave this great speech, and I like said to him, like I hope I could, you know, with Hashem's help, one day do something. And he said, "You going into chinuch?" I said, "No." He goes, "You going into our bonus?" I said, "No." He goes, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "I want to be a lawyer." He goes, "So why don't you make money and give it to people like me to do this?" Like, no, there was I... no. It was like a crazy world. I mean, it's a little. I don't know, but anyway, no, no, it still it still is viewed that way for sure. Is it really? I th I think so. I mean, you're one of the you've, the, the few of of a, like a speaker who is not necessarily in that type of position who you know who provides that. So. Be, having people and opportunities when you were young, it shaped me and it, it, it gave me permission to say, listen, there's no boxes by Hashem, mm -hmm. you know, just got to do what Hashem wants. And a lot of these things, and I, I think it's completely, you know, let's say like, you know, Zeru, Binyan, Bechinach, right? There's, there's Zriya and Binyan, they're very different. So this is really Zriya. This is like whatever Hashem gives and wherever he plants, like I have no control over this. I don't have right. a, the more I try to plan it, the less it works. So totally hear um, you. But just being open, I think, to something a little different was was critical for me that I got wow. young, you know, from some great people. Would you say that there was a piece of advice of something that one of those people or anyone else that that shared with you that really, you know, like st sticks out to you? I don't know if it was advice. I think it was opportunity. You mm -hmm. know, it's Ali Friedman, who is that who is the regional director in Central East. Like when he gave me the chance to get up in front of the kids as a lawyer, meaning like when I got a chance, like I was involved in NCSY for a very long time, right? I was a, I was 10 years in Central East. Okay. So I wasn't there um. full time, but I was there for Shabbatons. I missed one Shabbaton in 10 years, but that's law school. That's, that's a lot of my law career, right? Mm -hmm. That's being a lawyer and then going to Shabbatons. Right. So like, he could have been like, listen, like it's been a pleasure, like, you know, join my board, but like, you know, I'm like, come on. But like giving me a chance to like do Havdalah and to do this and to that and to give Shiurim and that, that set a tone where you're welcome. And he told them straight, you're welcome to come back as long as you want. We, there's, there'll always be a place for you. Hmm. The, the opportunity and, and to be treated as somebody who's on the, so to speak, professional side. And you can tell, by the way, if you're on both sides, Mr. Shem, you, you can tell. Like, you know, lay leaders are like, you can, the, the conversation is a little different. Like, it's a little right. playing, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you could smell it. You know what I'm saying? Like, the guys on the professional side, they talk straight. Once there's a lay guy involved, there's like a little bit of that, like, you know, you laugh a little too hard at the jokes, right? You say <laughs> things, you know, the picture's a little rosier. Like, there's a little bit, of that, and you can literally, like, smell it. Yeah, so, yeah. get getting the opportunity to spend time on the professional side, so to speak, when I was able to, you know, disappear for conferences and uh, yachikalas, it, it had a big impact on on just how much I, I fell in love with it and just how much I believed in it wow. and how much I saw that the work that was being done was so critical for the Jewish people that, I, you know, I, I just hoped and prayed that I had a little bit of 
a little bit of an opportunity to play in it. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Well, you know, I'm, I'm so curious, what gave you the confidence to become one of the most popular Torah lecturers in, in the world without having that title rabbi? Meaning th- there is a certain amount of confidence that you, 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 and also anytime you speak, you, you exude that confidence and it's incredible. What, where, where did that, where did that come from for you? Oh, I'm totally insecure about it. Are you kidding <laughs> me? Like what confidence? What are you talking about? It's all Hashem. No way. I mean, it, really? it took me, wow. it's still not, I mean, like, listen, you, you always feel that you, you don't belong. Mm-hmm. You know, the idea that what are you doing in the room? I'm not always, but you know, many times, especially in the beginning, right? Right. Um, it it comes, listen to it's for me, but all from Hashem. And, and I mean that not just to be firm about it. Like right. I mean it cause it's legit. Mm-hmm. Like in that I don't, I think I believe it does come all from Hashem. So if you, if he gives you the opportunity to get, to get stuck in why me, I don't know is a productive use of time. Mm-hmm. So I felt, you know, early on and even now that ever given an opportunity, it doesn't make sense why. And so don't even think about that. Just try to deliver what matters to you in the way that matters to you. Right. Yeah. And, and, and it may not fall for everybody, meaning there are times I'm in the room and I'll say something and someone will be like, well, you know, you should have quoted more sources or like, and I'm like, this is what I care about. Like, right. These ideas, these topics, mm-hmm. these, this way of seeing the world. Like I like to use football. Like I just do. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry if like you need <laughs> to be a king, you know what I'm saying? Like I got it. Like in your world, the only muscles could be kings. Great. You know what I'm saying like, it's, it's not going to fly for you when I talk about Bill Belichick. So right, like, right. It's, it's, I'm not a rabbi. So like, don't put me in that category. Like sure. just, either, you, either you follow Bill Belichick or, you know, someone else will give you the king marshal. But I think, I think what's critical is that the more you let Hashem run it, hmm. the more it has to make sense. Hmm. And that's, you know, a, a theme that I think in life that, you know, there's a lot of people in life that have things that they don't really, you can't really connect why. And there are rabbis sitting in shuls that are really beyond them. And there are guys sitting in CEO suites that are really beyond them. And if you look at life, there's a lot of people sitting in places, you know, in politics and in institutions. And and when you really track how they got there, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, Lahavdil Elif Havdalas, like, you know, Yosef Atzadik was 30 years old, right? right? And right. he was taking over the entire world. Like, what was he doing there? <laughs> so the, the answer right. is that the Kush who runs the world. Yeah. And like, he could do whatever he wants. And and the more it, it becomes about him and you and less about them, the easier it is mm. for those that may be struggling with this. Wow. Wow. That's great. And the second thing is don't ever think that someone who, ex- who exudes confidence feels totally confident. Interesting. The, you know, even the people that, that you think like get up there and then fly, there's a lot of prep and there's a lot of self doubt and there's a lot, 100%. a lot of nervousness. There, yeah. There's been many speeches where I'm like, can I pull the fire alarm? I got to get out <laughs> many times in my life. I'm thinking, wow. I hope, I, I hope somebody hits the fire alarm because I cannot do this. Really? Um, wow. It's know, very it's inspiring for me to hear that. I mean, it's funny cause I like, I'm, you know, I'm a chazan on the Yom Noraim and people always say to me like, how do you, you know, how do you get to that point? And I'm like, I still get nervous every single time I oh, yeah. I'm like, it's not like, it's not like, Oh, just because I'm doing it, you know, for a couple of years at this point, like that doesn't mean I'm, you know, I'm done with it. Like I'm, I'm very much so still thinking going through every tune before, like, you know, so. Oh yeah. And by the way, I think it goes further. I think the minute you stop getting nervous mm. is the day you have to get nervous. Ah. Right. Because if you stop getting nervous, it's one of two things. Either you don't respect your crowd or you think you got it. And it's Hashem. So the minute he's like, oh, you got it. Oh, for real? Like, this is you the whole time? And <laughs> uh, now I'll you, show you who's oh, really you mastered yeah. it. Like, Hatzlacha. Like, let me know how it goes. I'll be in the crowd. Like, you don't want him in the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Like, the minute somebody gets up. And I've seen this before, by the way. I've seen this before. Like, the people that are either pretending or really are not nervous. Now, listen, if you're not naturally nervous, then God gave you another gift. Like, fine. Right, but right. that's also from Hashem. Like, it's, you know what I'm saying? Like, the confidence that you have is also from Hashem. So the difference between being nervous and confidence, if it all comes from Hashem, it's okay. But people that think that, like, they got it. I, I, that's a place that I, you know, I, I, I don't want to be around that. I don't want to be behind that guy. Totally. Cause you know, that's really where you start to put yourself in a position to fail. For sure. For sure. So you mentioned before that you, you know, were, were a lawyer and, um, I'm curious just, you know, cause to kind of like contrast the difference of how you were as a parent when you were a lawyer versus, you know, more so now, you know, as a public speaker, what, what, what was it like for, I guess we'll start with focusing on what was it like trying to be present as a father while being a lawyer, you know, lawyers generally have a lot of very intense hours or, you know, a lot of deadlines. So what what was it like for you? Well, still today, I mean, I'm still in the corporate world. I still spend the majority of my life in in that world, business world, Um, just not as a a lawyer per se, in a different different role in the company. But I wish I could say I was, you know, every every dad tries as hard as he can. And, And dads that are traveling and dads that have multiple things going on, it's hard. 
it's super hard because, you know, we live in a world where you, you, you don't turn off when you leave. And especially if you have to get on a, on a plane, it's hard. There's no one answer. The, the, the only answer that the only advice that I got was, you know, family is first versus mm -hmm. you say it's first. And that's a, that's a distinction. And I'm not saying that I've excelled at it. I don't want anyone to think that like, I'm a great, I'm, I'm just as good as I can be. Like, I don't want anyone to think that like, I'm, I'm great at being a dad. I'm trying like every other dad's trying. Um, the, I'll share with you the advices that I got and you know, you, whether I keep them or not is, is, is me and my kids. <laughs> right, right. Um, the two bits of advice that I got that were super powerful to hear them was one is like you said, you know, when you're home, you're home. Um, and knowing that, like knowing that there are plenty of Shabbos meals that nobody that want. And, and I, and I got the line of, please, can you have, and we kept it just the family or there's mm. plenty of days or plenty of times where a father has to just say, I know I could, but I really need to be here. Right. And the second thing is really to give your kids the, the veto power on what you do mm. or your, or your wife, uh -huh. I mean, mostly your wife, not really your kids. Right. So, and, and that, that's, that's a really big deal. Once the, once the family knows they can veto it, you're going somewhere, they can say, no, they have power. And when they have power, they feel responsible. Mm. And that's a different, now they're a shut of, right? The difference between a partner and a worker is that a partner has a say, a idea. So if a partner doesn't want to invest, you won't invest. But an employee has no choice. Interesting. When you make your mm. family partners, and the way you make them partners, you don't give them just the speech of we're all doing this together, like I'll see you in two weeks. Right, you right? really it's, like get them, get their involvement. You say like, what are your yeah. thoughts on me doing the following X, Y, Z? shouldn't I? Right. Yeah. Mm. Or, I mean, listen, the other way to do it is to include them, right? right. You come bring them up. Fine, that's for sure. But the more, I guess, the, the less known way is to give them the veto power and say, listen, like, what do you think? Should I or shouldn't I? Hmm. And let's talk it out. And if I should, we're doing this together. And if I shouldn't, we're doing this together. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's all of us together. So if, if especially when it comes to cloud, especially if you're balancing, right? If I'm going somewhere, you have a piece of this, right? We all have a piece of it. You know right, what I'm saying? Like right. the, 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 and it's, just, this is like straight up. Like, you know, if, if, if a husband, if a husband or a wife or kids, whatever, lets the other person go out, mm -hmm. they have a piece of it. So now do you want, do you want to do it or not? Right. I, I'm happy to be the one on the, on the plane, but we're doing this together. Mm. So that, that idea, that concept, I think is, is, is critical if you are, if you're listening to this and you have multiple things going on, right? This is something that's beyond your job, right? Right. Because if it's beyond your job, you really are in family time. And you know, I have a Rav and Eretz Yisrael, um, his name is Rav Moshe Levy. So he like, you know, beats me up a lot. <laughs> um, and he, he, he reminds me all the time that, you know, the Rechel Kamocha really is talking about your wife, mm. right? And, and your number one priority really is your children. And if you nail your children, then you can spend some more time with other people. Um, and it's not that Rafa Rechimochi, it's I got to help someone I don't know right, and let right. my family suffer. Mm. So when it comes to like serving Hashem, you know, there is a concept of make sure your family's okay before you go out to the world. Mm. And then you got to go out to the world. You can't just like make sure your family's right, okay right. and just watch whatever you want, right? But that idea, I think, you know, was very helpful. Yeah, that's a, that's a very strong time. idea. The, I never, I've never heard that before. The Rafa Rechimochi being like your, your family or your wife and your children. Wow, very strong idea. Beautiful. And we get lost sometimes. And this is, and it, listen, it, it's, it's important. And people that'll listen to this, that it's hard to hear it sometimes that sometimes it's more fun to go out into the world. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's more fun to be on a Shabbaton. It's more fun to speak to people that are just happy to hear and they'll give you the right smiles. And mm -hmm. sometimes the chinuch and the kiruv and the, and the whatever that you can do that is to strangers are... It's, it's hard in some ways, but it's also easier in some ways. Yeah. It's sometimes it's a lot harder to like, you know, take a walk with that kid who's driving you insane, mm -hmm. right? Or spend some time with your spouse when like, you're not going to see a major pop because you're not going to have to talk to talk to go, thank you so much. That was so inspiring. <laughs> right, I'm going right. to Israel now because of it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah. it's, and so in the world of where, you know, we can sort of determine how great we're doing. It's hard to see it. But in the world in which you really the effort and, and the achrayas is how Hashem sees the world. Sometimes that, you know, so how do you, and I'm not saying I've excelled in it. I don't right. know what to do. No, like, how do you break I, out of that? I mean, like, because you're, because you're, it's such a great point. I mean, like, it's, it is so much easier for people to just say, like, you know, I'm, I'm going to run to this right now. And, and that's like exciting because you're going from one thing to the next. How does, how does one find that same excitement in a way, or maybe not the same excitement, but how does one build that excitement into being with the family time, being with wife and kids, and you know. I if you're looking for a great way to have some good, clean, kosher fun with your children through the powerful effect of music, 
Look no further because J Karaoke is here. J Karaoke gives one and all the platform to belt out their favorite tunes from a library of thousands of Jewish songs, hundreds of artists, and genres across multiple decades of incredible Jewish music. Personally, I know that I love singing, I love it. I love karaoke, but I was really never able to get into it because it wasn't the Jewish songs. And that's where J Karaoke comes in with their huge selection from the latest hits to the classics. They even have nursery rhymes for your little ones. And with features like key changes to help you sing, to make you more comfortable as you're singing, and speeding it up or slowing down the song, they have really thought of everything. To enjoy Jewish karaoke your way, all you need to do is head to jkaraoke.com. Choose a subscription that fits for you. And to make it even more fun, you could purchase their state of art karaoke kit, which gives you the feeling as if you are today's top singer. You can insert whoever you feel it is. Connect your kit to any device, like it could be a laptop, a computer, a tablet, whatever it is. And you plug in your speaker, plug in your J karaoke microphone, and you sing away. It's as easy as that. That's all it is. And it's really fun. I checked out their website. It really looks amazing. They have an incredible, incredible amount of song selection. Anything you want. They got Thank You Hashem. They got Mordechai Shapiro. They really got it all. You can subscribe monthly for just $4.99 a month, yearly for $49.99. And we have a special deal here for you. For any of our listeners, if you use the code Jews Next Door, D O R, you get an additional 10% off. And if you don't want your children to be using a device with internet, J Karaoke has got you covered. You can download the app onto your desktop. Once you have it up, turn off the internet, let them sing all day long without the internet. Check out J Karaoke today and let the fun begin. So, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it starts with the recognition of the Tafkid, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I think this is, you know, the one thing that I got from Rabbi Levy who would really beat it over my head. And there were times where when the book came out and I was traveling, like there, there were times where you travel more than others, work and whatnot. And he would beat over my head a lot. Um, that you have to realize that this is an actual tough kid. Like, you know, your family, especially when it comes to children, you know, the goal really isn't just having them and making sure the school doesn't mess them up. Right, right. right? Like there, there's a tough kid here and the tough kid is really chinuch and it's really kirv and it's really hashpa. Like there's a real tough kid when it comes to children. And mm-hmm. it's even though it's more subtle in terms of the impact of the, the, the specific impact, it's much bigger in terms of the larger impact. Yeah. Right. So just getting that to me was a chiddush. Mm. Like just getting that, you, you know, you come out sometimes and like, if you do something, if you go somewhere, you feel so good about yourself. And then like the kids will make it, the kids will figure it out. But just being able to redirect and understand that your tafkin really does begin in your home. Mm. Like we say it. So it's like become cliche, right, but like right. it actually really means something. I remember one time I was going somewhere, really, and I had to, I, there, was a, there was a trip of some sort that I was doing, and it was right after one of our children were born. And like the organizers on the trip were like, you know, you're going to come. And, you know, it was, it was hard. The kid, you know, it was harder than we had anticipated, you know, sort of the, the, new, the newborn. So I called my rub and he's like, are you out of your mind? Like, are you joking? I'm like, no, but you understand if you go, the impact. He's like, are you crazy? Like... You're leaving your wife to go, what is wrong? Like, it's not even like, <laughs> wow. So he's like, work it out with her. And I remember the organizers were like, it was like the same guilt that I got when I was went to law. It was like mm-hmm. the same, it's like the same guilt. Like, Interesting. Like you're, you, know, you know, you can change clock. People love saying things like, you can change. We love saying we're going to change the world, by the way. Everyone thinks they're changing the world, right? Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, they're talking about like, you know, 50 people, right? Or a thousand people, <laughs> right, like right. at most 10,000. You know what I'm saying? Like there's 15 million, like, but, but it, it feels good to say the words, you can change the world. And like, wow, I could, like, it's a lot of it is like the rhetoric that we use to pat each other on the back. Right, but, right. but the guilt that I got for like missing a couple of days on a trip that I already went to because the, the house needed to be home and at home, I wasn't going to do anything. I was just going to be home and help with, you know, bottles and diapers. Right. And like to my rub, he's like, are you out of your mind? It's not even a question. You stay home. And like to, to some people, it's like, you, you're going to miss the chance to inspire. So really, in my opinion, really, 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 that's, I think how I think Hashem sees it. Mm-hmm. Take care of your family first. Right. And if you do that correctly, or even along the way, if that's where your priority is, you'll, you'll find room to go out and if, if I want you to give to others, because I got to tell you personally, if Hashem doesn't want you, you're not going to go out. And even if you go out and you're behind the microphone on a podium, if he doesn't want you, you're not going to make an impact. And even if you do say the right things and people do think like they're impacted by you, they may not, it may not actually last for more than five seconds. Like 
you, the impact that we make is right. 99 percent Hashem. Yeah. And when we're follow, we're trying to follow His ways, that usually requires more effort and less exposure. Mm -hmm. Then you can put yourself in a position to make an impact. Wow! Again, not because I've done this, but because I've I've learned this. No, it's a great point. It's a really it's a it's a really powerful point. What would you say? You know, as you left the law, I mean, I know you're still involved in a, in a different way, but did your you know being a father change in any way during that during that transition? As you became more, and also like as you took on more of a of a speaking type of a a role in the world. Being out of the house changes things. Yeah. Right, and that's really the question: is how long are you out of the house? Mm -hmm. And I, in my opinion, I don't think it has, it's really connected to, you know, what we call say like cloud travel mm -hmm. as much as it's connected to just being out of the house. Uh -huh. You know, I, I have friends of mine who just have season tickets to the Knicks <laughs> and right. like to go out with their friends once a week and seem to be at every single cocktail hour for real estate. And they're out of the house much more than I'm, than, you know, somebody else who's, right, right. you know, get, so like, but it's different, right? Cause it's business, right? I remember one time my wife got a lot of musser from one of her friends because I was a law, I was a lawyer, right? So I was working pretty hard. I was working for Davis Polk, which is a pretty sweatshoppy law firm. Yeah, yeah. How it is now in like the new world. But back when I was around, they really killed you. Yeah. So I wasn't home at night a lot. And then like the thought that I would get on an airplane and like fly to like Cleveland to hang out with high school kids. Like, it's like <laughs> you gotta be kidding me, right? <laughs> right. So my wife, my, my wife got it once from one of her friends. Like, really, your husband really needs to learn. It's time to grow up. Like, we were also involved when we were kids. But like, no, come I... on. Like, she, you know, like one of those like good old friends. So like, I remember we're like, we had a whole conversation about it. And then like the next week, this woman who gave my wife the, the whole, you know, Muster speech about how I got to give Ben CSY was by her house for Shabbos alone. And I said, like, where's your husband? He goes, oh, you know, he's on a business trip. I'm like, he's on a business trip. <laughs> he works so hard every night. Like, where's he going? Well, there's an opportunity to open a new business and he's wherever for like a week and a half. I'm like, wait a second. Wait a second. Oh, <laughs> my wife got it. Cause I want to for Shabbos. Your husband's away for a week and a half. And that's cool. Like, yeah. what's up? <laughs> right. For business, it's okay, right? For right. money, I can fly wherever I want. Like, it's money. I could be every single night, like, right, at a right. cocktail hour for the chance that someone make, gives me a deal. It's not right, right? You're, when you're a dad, count the nights out of your house. Those are the nights out of your house. Yeah. And whether you're going out for business or for klal or for learning, like, it counts. So you have to make a cheshbin. And then you got to figure out, like, why am I leaving? And is it critical and necessary? And what's the reason? And to me, that's, it's the same. And you have to try to increase the quality of why you're leaving because your kids know. So when you leave for cloud or for learning, it, now if you have to leave, I spent a year of my life, one of the things that in the company that I work at, I, there was a period of time where I was launching what's called a capital markets department, mm -hmm. which was basically raising money. Right, right. There was a time in my life that I was on an airplane every single week for two days. Wow. There was a time in my life where we, we, we bought an asset in Baltimore hmm. and I spent two days a week, every week living in the inner harbor, Baltimore. So I'm not in any way that wow. no one should think that like I'm the prize of I'm home every night. Like there are plenty of years of my life where I was out of the home one night a week, every single week. So wow. and that you're I'm saying not, that wasn't even just for speaking, meaning that wasn't but, for speaking, that's for work. Right, like right. we ran an asset. I had to live there because I had to oversee the asset. I would have hmm. moved to Baltimore because I liked living where I live. So that, mean, that meant I had to get on a train every Tuesday morning and I came home Wednesday night or Thursday night wow. So for like two years. So I'm not saying that I don't leave. I'm saying that we should, once you start equating business travel and pleasure travel yeah. with cloud travel, you'll realize, people will realize there's a lot more travel that, you, that you, you're doing that if you just substitute it with cloud stuff. Mm -hmm. The Parnassar will most likely be there, in my opinion. Right. So that's the ambitious business, too. And and you, you'll maintain the time that you, you, you're maintaining anyways hmm. with your relationship with your kids. It's a really great point. I'm curious, you know, this happened like many years ago. I was, I was uh, many, many years ago, I was a schnitzel guy. And I remember being working at a bar mitzvah once, and someone said to me, you know what that is? That's Charlie Harari's son. And I, I remember, I literally at that time, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, I wonder what it's like for him being, being that. Meaning, to, how did it affect your children? being Charlie Harada's children, like, did, did it affect them being in the spotlight, having a father who's in the spotlight? Like, did that, did, did you feel that affected them? What do you think from their perspective? Like, I'm, I'm super curious to hear. I'm a nobody. I'm a regular dude. Man. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like a regular, I, whatever I shouldn't put in. It's Charlie Harada, what do you mean? <laughs> I, like, I, I think between, between me and you, it's hard to be the rabbi's son. Mm -hmm. Meaning, I, I don't think it's, I, I, I don't, I don't well, why? think what's, that, what's, that what would you say is different meaning the obviously rabbi, you're not viewing yourself as that but no but like I'm like a regular guy meaning like because you know the rab I find it harder for the rabbi's kids because because the, the human brain lives in trees right it's really hard for us to live 
in the far, to look at the forest, right? Mm -hmm. the, that's how our mind works. Like if you ever heard a story or saw a movie or something with someone that dies, right? And you find yourself crying. Like you ever wonder, like, why do you do that for, right? right. It, 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 the guy didn't actually die, right? He won an Emmy Award for dying. So why are you crying? <laughs> Right, and the answer is because the mind is really good at getting into the weeds. That's mm -hmm. just how we work. It's a survival technique that Hashem gave us. So it's like, a, you know, when you're in high school, like you think your life is your high school, right? When you're living it, that's why people get up and say, we're changing the world and they're talking to 80 people, right? <laughs> like because they, they think, because that's their world. They don't know that there's a million Jews mm -hmm. in their neighborhood that's not keeping Shabbos, that, they, that, that are not coming to shul, right? right, right. They're not involved, but it, th th this is the Jewish people. You ever hear this? Like, we are <laughs> representing the Jewish people. Like, really? They, right. you know how many Jews that don't even know your name? Like, why Why do they say, they don't mean, they're not trying to be God. It's because our mind is very good at staying in the, the weeds in which we're in. Mm -hmm. So that means that if you live in a community, the rabbi is usually the most exposed guy in the community. Now, if right. you go to a different community a lot, it's different. But if you live in your community where most people live, right, they work and play in their community. Right, right, right. To me, the fishbowl of each community, the, the harder thing is the rabbi's kids. Mm -hmm. Like to me, I, I have tremendous respect for every single rav, assistant rav, and their children because I don't know how, how they do it. Because, you know, the, the, your dad's always in the front, right? He, he, every Shabbos he speaks, not to some group that never heard him before, and then he's leaving that out on an airplane, <laughs> right, right? right? Like, right? Like, and, and he can use the same stuff because they didn't hear it in Chicago yet until Torah anytime. God bless them. He came and put it on the thing. But, like, for the most part, you get to recycle. This Robin's got to get up. God bless him. Come up with new stuff every single week, right? Always be inspiring. Step up huge for Yontif. And then there's a whole there's a whole group of Hever that think they're the rabbi that has to comment. <laughs> and then there's, like, a bunch of kids that are his kids that have to, like, play with the rest of the kids. I find that the hardest kids that have to go through it are the rabbi's kids. And when they do it, God bless them. Like they're, th th those are the heroes. Like, right, you know right. what I'm saying? Like, I hear you. So you, you, you didn't know, find that it affected your kids? No, no, no. I don't think so. Like nice. I, maybe, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, but, but like, you know, maybe I, I, you know, I hear you. So yeah, let's, 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 let's get into the, uh, into your your household. How did you try to help your children develop a close relationship with Hashem? How did you, you know, like you said before, like it's all about that, you know, like really your your household. So, you know, let's go through some of the things that you've done with your household. Let's start with- Well, I'll, I'll give you my ashkafa, right? Sure. And whether it, it delivered is, is not, I don't know, it's my, you know, but I'll, I'll tell you some of the things that I learned and I'll, I'll tell you where I learned it from. Most of what I learned about Hashem and the family is from Ramosha Weinberger. Hmm. And so his way of seeing the world has a very big impact because I've been sitting two feet from him for the past 15 years. Yeah, that's awesome. And when you hear him speak, very much the hashkafa of Hashem is, is critical. Listen, Hashem is a complicated thing for kids because first of all, they don't get it because yeah. it's Hashem. Um, and second of all, because when the kids are little, you, you don't really got to, there's a certain amount of consequence that's required for kids to stay in the system. So the idea of, you know, you know reward and consequence is normal when you raise children. Right. So you can very quickly get into the world of if you do this, you get this and this is good. And we like this. We don't like this. Right. Mitzvos, Averos. So the, the chinuch of kids when they're little can really very much fall into Hashem being sort of like a ref hmm. um, or worse, being like, you know, the person who's like usually you know disappointed in you. Now, if you're a kid that sits nicely and can like memorize and analyze, you can have a pretty easy time because most places you'll be successful. But if you can't sit along the way, you'll probably find some rough who's really frustrated you because you're disrupting the classroom. And then all of a sudden, then Hashem starts becoming more and more disappointed in you. Right, right. right? Interesting. And, and that's a challenge because, you know, it's very easy for, you know, sitting in education to go to Hashem being mad at you. Right. Whether you can follow Gemara and whether Hashem is mad at you really are two different things. Yeah, yeah. But some, sometimes they collapse. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, no, as a, as a classroom teacher, I mean, I, I see that all the time. My students think like, oh, they're like, say like, Rabbi, I know you hate me. I'm like, I don't, I don't hate you. I love you. I love you so much. Sometimes distracting. That's a separate thing. Just because right. you, it doesn't mean I, you know, yep. you're, you're an amazing, you're an amazing individual, amazing person. But, you know, two, but they, they have a hard time seeing it as two separate things. Yeah, and there's, there's a chilek here. There's three, I would say there's three things. One is that some rabbis don't really get that. They don't really understand mm -hmm. that like for a kid under the age of like fifth grade, like there's Hashem and on top of Hashem is their rav. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I got this from a first grade teacher in Shiva Katana. Like he said, brilliantly, he said, people need to understand. And when you're a pre-1A first grade, second grade teacher, like there's your parents, there's the Rabboni Shalom, then there's your Rebbe, <laughs> right? And when the Rebbe's like upset because the classroom's out of control right. and the kids see it, and little kids, they're trained in, in verbal recognition, right? That's how kids communicate when they're little. Before right. speaking takes over, they're watching. 
So little kids grow up with the world and, and there's a lot of kids that walk around. I think like Hashem's disappointed. They're still from, right? Because where are they going? They're like in third grade. Right, but like right. they deep down are starting to create a relationship in which he's disappointed. Hmm. And davening is a big deal, right? Because you come to shul and do you, or do you stay in shul? Don't you stay in shul? Right? That whole world is another world. So when you get out of shul, when you get out of school, then you got to go to shul, right? So now you got to sit next to your dad it's for two and a half hour thing. chakras and right. like forget about it. And in some shuls, like forget it. They can torture you. But yeah. I mean, like you can't believe like, you know, laning can take an hour and a half till everybody gets on Shabbat. And, you know, they're still using, you know, tunes from 1947. Like, <laughs> and like the kid is going out of his mind. Like, you know, between Shweki and Mordechai Shapiro, every week is a new <laughs> awesome song. And then it comes to shul and like, they're still rocking the songs that they use when they first came back from the Holocaust, right? right? right. So the kid's going nuts and dad's mad. But he, you know, or, or if he's really like, you know, he's, he's passive aggressive mad. Whatever right, it is. Right, like, right. There's a lot of, so you can be like a 13 year old boy and have like an enormous amount of disappointment. Mm -hmm. That's all bad. Yeah. Right? All of it. 100%. All of it. And that's what the Rahamri is like. All of it. Just let, let it go. All of it. Rahamri once said, they said, when should you start bringing your kids to shul? He said, when they're ready. So he says, well, at what age? So he says, whatever you do, the agent, you're not going to get mad at that. Uh -huh. So he says, I don't understand. So he says the greatest line, or why goes, this is what, I heard this one slide, was great. He said, who are the best daveners in Kali? So walk into a shul, someone's going nuts. Who's the best davener? Usually, Bali Chuva. You walk into a show and a guy's down like crazy. Yeah. About you, right? 100%. 100%. The guy's going nuts. Like nuts, nuts. Not like, you know, reserve nuts. There's a, there's some good yeah, like You got the shuckles. You got the, yeah. shuckle, <laughs> the whole thing, saying the word slowly, excited for dominating. I remember one time I was speaking at DRS Chabaton with Alan Weingrad. Uh -huh. Alan Weingrad? <laughs> sure, sure. Dude, Every once in a chakras, they called up at 9 a.m. At 8 45, he's at his chair and he's like, Where is everybody? Yeah. Like, they're starting at nine. Like, it's you got to be here on time because just in case, I'm like, Bro, just give yourself two to three years, man. You can show up at 9 15. Like, every other food. What's going on, right? What, so, Ravarmir goes, Why are Bali Chuva such great dominants? Because you know why? So, Ravarmir goes, Because they didn't have fathers schlepping them to shul when they were little. Oh my you gosh, that's an like, awesome line. That's okay? crazy. So, the idea that, like, God has to be like, and I'm not saying I, I excel at this because I have also the expectations and I want my kids to grow up in a certain way. And I'm a regular dude, but like the expectations and the mm. worry, that that parental feeling of that angst. Yeah, like that innate, that innate feeling that every parent feels, I need them to be. Exactly. Right, like whatever it is, yeah. That angst that that is characterized as a good thing for a parent mm -hmm. that translates in anything that's not positive. If it translates in, again, I'm going back to my other rubber, or Moshe Levy, if it translates in you taking your kid to the ball game, because you know that you want your kid to follow Torah and mitzvos, and you know that they do that because when they love daddy, they'll follow, God bless you, that's called chenach. That's what Levy tells me, it's called chenach. Right. So if it trans, if the angst translates to what can I do to be more positive, to make my house more exciting, to frame everything, right? One, there's a great story in Teaneck. I don't remember the, all the details, but I remember hearing this and being moved by the dad. You know the story about the dad who fell asleep at the Dafyomi? It's a great Misa. It's so deep. Yeah, I don't know. In Teaneck, somewhere, wherever it is, I'm sure maybe someone who listens knows someone who is the best person. <laughs> sure. In Teaneck, there's a dad who came to Dafyomi every single day, mm -hmm. sat in the corner and went back to sleep. Okay, so he shows up to shul, he goes to sleep. So the, the rub's like, you know, like, what's going on? Right, like, right. You just don't come. So he goes, no, 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 my kids are growing up and I need them to see that their dad wakes up at 5.30 in the morning and goes to learn. I don't care about learning. Right. I care about my kids. Right. Right. Now, I'm not saying that guys can <laughs> double the door. Right. But there's, there's a lot he, to say about that. Yeah. He hopped it. He hopped it. He goes, I can't tell my kids to learn. If I'm not at the level where I can get up at 5.30 and learn, at least I hop that the idea of me waking up out of my bed, mm -hmm. getting dressed and having my family see daddy leaves at 5.30 for dominating, I understand that's more chinuch than telling my kids to go learn. Yeah. So if you've got a great relationship with your kids and then you do from things and you're excited about Yiddishkeit and you're excited when they're part of Yiddishkeit, that's as good as you can do. Right, including right. the details of learning with them. But how do, how do parents take away those expectations? I mean, because like, in the end of the day, we all, it's, it's, I don't know if it's, is it coming from a, we feel a social pressure? Is it that we feel, this is my job, I need to parent, they, they come out this way. Whatever it is, whatever it is that's contributing to it, every parent feels a little bit like, I need to do X, whatever, even if it's not necessarily just in from areas, but you know, also in, 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 you know, within their religion, how do we, how do parents strip away those expectations to, to healthily be able to interact with their children? So the, I once saw a great stat, the thing from McKinsey, who said that the greatest trait that a CEO has is self-awareness. Mm -hmm. You want to know what great CEOs are? They're not 
necessarily the smartest in math or can see the markets or can buy spaceships. They're people that are aware of self. Right. And that's how they put around people around them that are better than them because they're aware of what they are. They're not always insecure. I think that applies to parents. Mm. The greatest parents that I've seen are parents that are incredibly self-aware. Mm. So if you're driving your kids to Frumkite because that's social acceptance, you better check yourself before, as they say, you wreck yourself. Right. Mm. Because you're going to mess your kids up. Because their connection to the Kodesh Baruch Hu is going to be based on your relationship with the people around you. And if you're using your kids as a pawn of competition, you can guarantee yourself that, that kid's going to know it. Mm. Because kids are super aware. right? Awesome. Or if you're, yeah. if you're driving your kids because you deep down want to always be this. Now, if you're driving your kids because you want the best for them, then great. The, I think between me and you, again, I'm not, an, I'm not an expert in anything. I'm just a regular dude. <laughs> I think the greatest problem is timing. What do you mean by Timing. That? People don't realize how long it takes for a Jew to be connected to Hashem. Mm. It could take 40 years. Really. You're really. saying like take take the long game is what you're saying. It, it could take 40 years. Yeah. I know guys that are 40 years old. 40. I see them in shul. Where Weinberger has not once let up on them. They're 40. They're 45. And now, for whatever reason, they're flying. I knew them at 25. Mm. I knew their families at 25. I knew their wife at 25. Right? It's the long game. You have to 120 with God's help. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, of course you have to always do true for the day before you die. You don't know when you're going to die. I got it. I got it. And yes, of course, there are moments in life that are critical, right? Your, your, your 12th grade year is going to determine Israel and Israel's matter. I get it. And there are moments where these critical, pivotal moments will change your life. But for every family that I know that got married and they were one way and they grew together and now are like flying, there's a family that grew up and they were like perfect in Yiddishkeit and now they're nowhere near perfect. Mm, they just look wow. perfect on the outside. Mm. And we both know people like that. Right, yeah, sure. And when people see kids that are 11, or that are 15. I'm not saying I'm one to learn from, because I'm telling you, I'm less important. I was such a, a disaster at 16, 17 years old. <laughs> what I put my parents through, like, I can't even be, I, if I told you, you wouldn't be like, okay, we're done. Click. <laughs> you over. Do you know what I was like in high school? You know what I was like as a senior? I was a total and complete disaster. <laughs> like, I, I could barely sit behind this mic. Can you imagine me for 12 years? Like, it was nuts. And like, if my parents would have like dismissed me from Yiddishkeit because of how uninterested I was in Yiddishkeit when I was a senior in high school, right. I would be like, I would be sitting in, a, I would, I would, I wouldn't even be close. Like each kid has their path. For some kids, and you see them in shul, they're 11, they finished off Yomi. You know what I'm right. saying? Like, God bless them. Yeah, yeah. They say like, okay, it's in the Shava. Some kids, they're 25. And I'm not saying that they could be like blowouts and you can allow that to happen. I'm not saying don't parent them. Right, right. I'm saying don't be so nervous. Mm. Positivity. And I think what gets parents, not myself included, again, I'm not one to learn from. I'm just in this like every other parent. What gets us nuts is that we're so scared that when you're scared, you panic. It's like right now in the market, we're in the middle of inflation. Right. And the world right now, it's in, you see this. And if you really speak to guys who know how to trade, they're watching, they're in, they're in control. They're not panicking because the market's volatile, mm. right? Steph Curry doesn't panic when he's down by two with eight seconds left, right? right? right. Professionals don't panic. And parents are not professionals because they learn it on the job. Yeah, yeah. Like we can't, so when you see a kid, and if you love Yiddishkeit and you love... And you, you panic. And I also panic. Right. And I also get, but the panic brings that negativity. Yeah. And the, also and when a person is in that panic state, you can't, you can't operate as, you know, as smartly as you usually can when you're not in that, you know, fight and flight panic state. Like it's just, it's impossible. You know, I, like, yeah, yeah. I found kids and sometimes I talk to kids that are now they've gone through this. There was one person that I've spoken to who had a very difficult religious childhood, like disaster. She would email me every once in a while and I would, you know, whatever. And I would try to give her a little chizik. So she once said to me, like, you know, uh, you know, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I just came out of McDonald's. Like, waiting for me to be like, you mm -hmm. know what? You came out of McDonald's. And, like, she was, like, she was, like, like goading me to right. tell her that she's not. Because that's how, that's how her life was. Mm -hmm. Right? And sometimes kids do that in a more subtle way. And what they're doing subconsciously is they're, they're checking if mommy loves me because of me or mommy loves me because I'm religious. Mm. Wow. And there's a huge difference. Yeah. And I don't believe that our job in life is to love your kids because. Because I don't believe Hashem loves you because. Right. I believe you. Love. People, I, and I believe that. Meaning you don't follow Torah mitzvahs in order to get Hashem's favor. You follow Torah mitzvahs because it's good for you. Right. 
both in this world and in the next world. Mm. And it's good for your soul and it's good for your body. I, I think the greatest life you can have is a life of Torah and mitzvahs. But once you start to think that you follow Torah and mitzvahs in order to get Hashem's love, he doesn't love you. He loves himself. And when a parent, even though they don't really mean it, because they love the kid unconditionally, when a parent is showing the kid, my love for you is conditioned. And it doesn't have to be Yiddish guy, by the way. There are kids who think their parents love them because they do go well in school or right. they're athletic, right. right? Or they have a certain job. The minute a kid feels their love is conditioned, they always question the parent's love. Yeah. And to me, that's the hardest. Again, not that I've excelled in it, but that's really the underlying pinnings of chinuch. Is the, and you see this with the Rebbe's all the time. All the time. And Mora's also. The underlying foundation is, I love you for you. Right. And I believe in you for you. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the details. But you'll never be able ever to not get me excited that you're in the room. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Would you say that there's any, you know, like your most proud moment as a parent, as a parent, like any, anything that sticks out to you? I, I'll tell you what I, I think about a lot, you know, now more than ever, it's not me, but it's all of us. I, I, I feel very lucky, honestly, that we were, I was given a Jewish education. I got to tell you this, like, as I get older, maybe like as the white starts to come in, <laughs> like I'm like getting even like almost like emotional about it. Like I feel lucky. And the more times I meet people that are great, awesome people that would be very much involved in the religious Jewish community if they had the chance, mm. never really. I feel like I don't know what I did to deserve it. Really. I don't know what I did in my life to deserve being born into a family that paid for my Jewish education, to be sent to Israel almost as, as a matter in point after, after high school, right, to, be, right. to, be, to be around from people, to naturally know how to read Hebrew. You know how many Jews there are out there that want to be connected to Judaism, but they can't read Hebrew and they're 35. Do you know how hard it is to navigate the world that Hebrew? When I see Jewish kids do Judaism, but like the way I did Judaism. Like when I see little kids singing like power in pajamas <laughs> in the middle of the night, right. when I see little kids singing like Modani, Lefana, when I see kids with the same sort of stale Pesach questions, you know, like the same stuff, right? right? right. You know what I'm saying? Like when you, at first I was like, come on. But when I see little kids, Little kids getting tickets to scream Amen Yehesh or 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 kissing their little tzitzis and, I feel so overwhelmed hmm. with pride because that's the Masora being passed. And yeah. like we're watching the Masora or watching like we did it, like our parents did it. And it's being done through a culture in many ways of positivity. Right? Yeah. Like it's so we, we take it for granted because it's not it doesn't stand out. But we shouldn't. When you go to a school and you see a sitter play and you see the kids like sing, singing the same songs about how I'm going to kiss my sitter and, right. and they're so excited to get that sitter. Like forget the 15 year olds that like haven't found their way to dominate. <laughs> forget that. Just look to the one year olds right, or like, right, you know, right. the, the six year olds. Right. Like we as people in a world where everything has to be better, quicker, faster, forget to stop and like say and to be proud mm. of our community that manages to give each generation the same powerful foundation, right? right? That, I, and, and I, I honestly, and again, I don't mean to be like nostalgic, I feel Hashem loves that. Like we think Hashem only loves it if. I really feel the normalcy of Judaism, like, you know, the stuff that we take for granted, like the, the, the Hana out of the No Tachnan Mondays, <laughs> the, the joy of the bagel after the fast days, like, you know what I'm saying? Like the Kaila that everybody knows, like all that small stuff, right? The, the pump fake, you see the guy when you're fasting on like, you know, yeah, during yeah. the... <laughs> like the Mincha Minyanim in the hallways of the, of the buildings, like all the little things that make our people our people, the Chinuch that passes, we have to stop and like be nana from. Right. Because when we do it, we're gonna get more excited to pass it to our children. And when, you, when you're nana from the subtle beauty of our, then the other stuff fits in. Mm. It, it does. The, do you daven at this minion or that minion? Do you keep this or that? When, when a kid feels like I am so lucky to be part of this group, right. he'll, he'll show up, he will, he'll show up. He'll show up. And when he feels a part of our people, even though he can't learn Gemara in eighth grade or ninth grade, he'll show up. 
He will, he'll, he'll, and you just keep at it, he'll show up. If you look closely enough at the different communities in America and you see how many middle-aged people are on fire now. Right. Afiyomi on fire. Yeah, yeah. And, There's so much they, Torah being learned now. It's like incredible. So much. And they yeah. show up to Yom Eons and they learn Pneumius and, and they, they sh- you take them to the, you know, NCSY Shabbaton and they're dancing with the kids. And yeah, yeah. They're so proud of their kids to go. They didn't get turned on at 20. Mm-hmm. They didn't. They got turned on at 45. Right. Such a long game. It's such, and I, I love that so point about the patience. timing, the long game. We have till 120. It's such a great point. There's so much time. Yeah. Why rest? Why mess up the kid at 13? Yeah. Why yeah. have the kid think that he's a no good because he got a, a, a 60 on a Gamar? Like, why ruin it? Because he he's not catching up. Big deal. Right, right. It's unbelievable how many people were at, were at the head of the pack. I have a friend of mine who, when I went to Israel for the year, he was like the f- starkest guy in the room by far. And like, I don't even know if the guy even Dobbins now. Like, there's no race. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a long It's true. Everyone and, feels it's a race. It's a very good point. Wow. It's a very good point. So you'd say for yourself, your, your proudest moment as like parents is the fact that you're able to take that long view with your, with your own children and, and you know, like kind of take that away a little bit. I try. try. I can't say I, I succeed. I don't want anyone to think <laughs> that I succeed at anything. Really, like, I'm just as nervous and just, I'm just, I'm sharing the wisdom that I got, not right, that right. I've, I've succeeded at. Would you say that there's anything that you have like regrets in the way that you've parented your children ever? I know that's a very personal if, question. If, yeah, no, I think it, it would be in that same category. I ah. think that the moments where I panicked or the moments, I think the greatest regrets as parents, to be honest, is not appreciating the time with your kids. Mm. I think as kids get older, parents start to realize that just the time alone is worth it. Yeah. And you know, when, when the kids are little, they're not as exciting because after they're okay and healthy and Mitzvah Shem and, and they're somewhat entertained, like you move on to things that are more intellectually stimulating. Right. And as the kids get older, you start realizing that like, I gave up so much time with them and they were ready for me. Now they've got friends and they're, they're too busy and they're running around the, wherever they're running. And now, you know, you're in the, not in the way, but you're, you're like, you're not as critical. When, when kids are little, they're critical. You're, you're critical to them. When kids are big, you're less. Right. You start to learn as, as, as you get older, the idea of kasha elai pridaschem, like the Kurdish Baruch who's saying like, just give me one more day. And you're right. like, come on. And it's because Hashem's like, I just want to spend a little time with you. Like I kind of, you guys are so big and important. You know what I'm saying? Like right, right. You're, you're big. You're like, you know, you're important. You have all your friends and you're, you're too busy hawking about what you're hawking about. Like, I just want to get a little bit of time with you. I think that's the hardest part. And I, I think when you're, when they're little, even as you get older, like we're so busy trying to get our kids to do something and be something. We forget just to be with them and just to be like, it's a very hard thing for Jews is to be, even though Hashem, Hashem's always trying to get us to be, and he's shutting down the world on Shabbos and giving us yontifs. Right, right. And if you're, and if you're in Gullus, you're lucky. I find it to be that you're lucky with three day yontifs and you get lot. Sometimes you get, I love three day. Like, you know, you get like yeah, yeah. lots of time off. And still, we're so busy doing and yeah. doing. And it's doing. like that. I feel like you did that right with that commercial. They did the disconnect to connect, Just right? Yeah, to disconnect. Dis- yeah. yeah. Same yeah. thing. And to me, that's of my biggest regrets: the lack of appreciation of being. Because when you're in it, you're so busy doing. We're always thinking of the next stage, mm-hmm. and you get to the next stage and go, "Why didn't I appreciate the stage before?" Right. And it's it's like that in everything in life. Yeah, yeah, it's very true. You're never really satisfied until you choose to be really satisfied. Yeah, so true. One of one of the unique, I guess, challenges that with today's youth or you know teens especially also is the is the apathy, which I feel like especially your speech is like you really you you inspire people and you get people to to really feel. So what what is what is a way that parents can, I guess, help their children combat that apathy that is so prevalent. You know, within our within the youth and the teens, I think it's excitement. I, I think it's parents are so busy that sometimes they forget to be excited, mm. and so as a result, they are not projecting excitement to their kids because they've done it already. Like you know, a, a dad who's been to shul, if you're kid, like he's been, to, he knows what's going to happen. He's got he's he's balancing his life and his emails, and so. He's worried that his kids aren't excited because he's worried they're not going to be connected. Meanwhile, he's just as not unexcited. Right. Right? Interesting. Like I, I said it by, with a joke, but like the level of excitement that you have for no, no it's time a great for point. That's such an interesting like, point. We're so excited to not do sometimes to be. Rawar Magur spoke about the Shabbos, the difference between the mitzvah and being yotze from the mitzvah. Like, what's more exciting? Mm. You know, leaving shul after davening <laughs> or coming to shul before davening? Right. right. Like, you know, there's a lot here: exotelic, autotelic, like. We as adults have a chance to delve into the meaning of things, which will then give us more excitement for the thing. Like once you learn how to do something, 
Now you can delve into why you do it, right? So someone who's, let's say, in, in his late 30s, mid 40s, or 50s, right? You, you've dove in so many times that you now can take time and learn why you dive in. So as a result, it would only increase your excitement to dive in. Right. But because you know how to do it, you're prone to do something else. So now davening maintains the same level of knowledge that you had when you were 15, when you mm. just figured it out for the first time. Right. But right. now you got to do it. So the level of uninterest just continues to grow up. Right, right. So you take a guy who's 40, he doesn't want to go daven, but he has to because he's already bought into it culturally, right? Or he believes that Hashem will give him good stuff. Right. But he's apathetic to it, but he's just better at conditioning apathy. Mm. So now he's worried that his 13-year-old's apathetic before he's learned how to condition it. 13-year-old and him are the same person. This right. 13-year-old doesn't have to do it because he's not going to like cause a, a, a war in the house or be considered to be off the derech, right? He's just 13. But dad's also not excited. Mom's not excited either. And that's the greatest challenge is that stuff that we know how to do isn't exciting. Mm -hmm. When we're in a position to look at Judaism and delve into why we do what we do, which will only increase our excitement. Right. 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 I remember one, one Rav once said to me when we were in Israel for the year, he said that um, a guy was giving him a whole thing about America and Israel, how in America it's hard to be Jew, religious, whatever. So he says, um, you know, he was wearing a, 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 a Red Sox hat. Mm -hmm. And he says to him, you're a Red Sox fan? He goes, yeah. He goes, don't you live in New York? He goes, yeah. He goes, you ever go to Yankee Stadium? He goes, better believe it. He goes, of course you take off your hat. He goes, never. <laughs> yeah, go, you can't take off my Red Sox hat at Yankee Stadium? He goes, I would send a Yankee bleachers with my hat on. He goes, you would be Meister Nefesh? He goes, the Red Sox. He goes, Any day of the week, Rabbi. He goes, why? He goes, because I, I would. He goes, you know why? Rabbi says, he goes, because you grew up and your father was yelling at the TV every single Sunday. <laughs> You watch your dad yell at a TV because he's a Red Sox fan. You know what it says in your head? What he's yelling at is me, and it's important. <laughs> because if your dad would yell at a Harusa every single day in, in wow. the house, yelling, you would learn Gemara even if it was 3 o'clock in the morning. Wow. I if love that. skipped to Shul Shabbos morning and came home and told the kids, Musaf was insane. You know what I realized? Tamer Chaim Zachu, when you eat it, and the ra and even if the dad was faking it, no, mm. not really faking it, but right, no, dad was, was you're projecting, it, projecting it. it, right? Right, projecting it. The kid would be like, "What?" By the time you were my age, he goes, "You'd be sitting every Shabbos. You'd be in shul at eight, eight o'clock for an eight thirty Shabbos." Mm. Like apathy is. Because remember, most of our desires is mimetic desires. It's what it's imitation desire. It's what someone else projects, right? The only reason we think something's stylish is because somebody else is wearing it. The only reason why I want it now because you know I used to teach in Sai Sims, right. right? It was amazing. I, I taught a class on entrepreneurship. There was a, the fifty kids in the class. I was like, when I grew up, entrepreneurship means you couldn't get a job. <laughs> we all wanted to be lawyers. What happened? You know what happened? Forbes and Inc. happened. A couple of pictures of Mark Zuckerberg, and everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Right, right. So funny. We're imitating. So when true. You wow. Show excitement for Yiddishkeit. Hmm. You could be sure the people around you will be like, what do you got? What are you on? Right? And, and first they'll be maybe a little threatened by you. Like, oh my God, what's wrong with you? Right. Because that's normal. Because if you're excited and I'm not, I, there's something must be wrong with you. Yeah, yeah. And after, after a while, the people that are in your employ or in your world, hmm. you could be sure. I love you that. Sure it's like what you, uh, the idea that you're sharing is, is it's modeling, but like on such a higher level. Like hmm. it, it's, it's the excitement, but with such a depth behind it. Oh, I love it. Wow. That's for sure. awesome. For that's sure. Awesome. You see it all the time. You see it all the time. Dad gets into Dafiomi. And the dad never learned. He gets into Dafiomi and he starts to love it. Love it, love it, love it. Hmm. You could be sure the next cycle, a kid's, one of his kids are involved. Yeah. For sure. It's always like that, right? Mom ends up on some trip and she's, she's inspiring secular women. And like, she never did that before. And now she's like doing it. She's like hosting people. You can be sure one of the kids is going to like, a, and why. like it always works like that. Hmm. That the thing that you care about, they care about. But what doesn't work is that if you don't really care about it, but you're worried that they're not going to care about it, right. so you tell them to care about it. Right, right. right? They don't Telling them doesn't like, do anything, oh, right? They only follow who you are, right, and it's right. so much harder to change who we are. Yeah. It's so much easier to say stuff, and that's the hardest part of, of, of influence, yeah. is that it's got to be real. Hmm. But That's awesome. You know, tefillah, I know we spoke about it before in terms of the, in, in terms of like, the approach in terms of how much we, you know, are, are on top of our kids, but in terms of the tefillah itself, you know, tefillah is a very hard area for, for children, for teens. How can we help our children and teens have a better tefillah experience? Not just in terms of like, you know, bring them when they're ready, but also like to help them connect more to tefillah itself. So I, I have, I have radical views on this. Please. I'm not in any way to Pascha and Chilas. I'm not a Rav, I'm a nobody. So yeah. I'll, just, I'm, I'll share about radical views. You know, one of the greatest mistakes, I'll share something with you that's sort of inside baseball, right? There's a huge disconnect in Kali Yisrael. Huge, huge. It's over one practice that we have in which we are, we have diametrically opposed views on. Mm -hmm. 
Sfardim and Ashkenazim. People think that Sfardim and Ashkenazim, their biggest disconnect is rice on Pesach, <laughs> right? It's not. The biggest disconnect between Sfardim and Ashkenazi is Slichos. Mm. Most Ashkenazis that I know do not like Slichos. Right. Most Sfardim that I know- They love it. Love yeah, Slichos. Yeah, it's like, it's the exciting time. love Slichos. And people are like, oh my God, but you gotta do Slichos for a month. I'm like, I don't gotta do your Slichos for a month. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, if I had to do your Slichos for a month, I'd go nuts. Yeah. I have my Slichos. My Slichos are awesome. You understand? I look forward to Slichos the entire year. It's not easy to wake up that early. And it's not easy to get another hour of dominating in. Mm -hmm. But why? Slichos, I feel, are like designed for davening. Mm -hmm. You're sitting most of the time. You're singing most of the time. Even when you're not singing, you split psukim. So the, so the chazan only says half the pasuk. Mm. And you say the second half of the pasuk. Right. There are so many times where he says the thing and you say amen. Do you know what it's like when you have 30 minutes where you're sitting for most of it, you're saying amen for lots of it, you're you're answering psukim, so like you're only in and out, you're singing. It's very it interactive. Is such an enjoyable, yeah. participatory, not incredibly long communal experience. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's awesome. You know, I see it in like with the, with the Sparman school, whenever we do like tishes or something like the chias, like the excitement that they have, even like, even we're talking about a kid who, who couldn't get in, who not into Gemara, it doesn't, in, in oh, yeah. regular, whatever, but like the chias, like you just, you see it. And the way they talk about slichos also, I mean, the chias in general and then slichos, like it's amazing. Uh, I one time spoke at, at the Mishadi community in, in Great Neck, mm -hmm. right? I went there. It was one o'clock in the morning, pre house. Okay. Now I want you to picture me going to any shul in the world at one <laughs> o'clock in the morning. What do you think two o'clock slichos would be? Not the first slichos. Two o'clock. How quickly would you go from one to 10? Right. It would be on like speed six. Right. right? Two o'clock. The guy and I'm, people in the room weren't like old, old time, holy Jews. Mm -hmm. It was like 22 year old single cool, good look, men and women. Right, right. Slichos took an hour. I was like, hurry up, people. <laughs> so I'm not saying we should all be smarty, although that'd be great for everybody, but I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm saying my opinion, again, it's a little radical, is when the kids are little, forget when you, when you have chiyuvim, then you gotta get into tefillah. Before you have a chiyuv to daven, when they're little, the more tefillah can be singing, can be less but targeted, the more tefillah can be something that is exciting. I personally think the kids should daven with more song. Mm. Uh, we, we have like Ashrayo and we have like a couple of songs, right, but like right. I think the half of it should be that the end and the beginnings of all of the Psukit Zimra should be some song. Mm. Like we should figure out a way when they're little, Forget when you're 13, then you should do what everyone else does. The, the, you should never change tefillah or the tzuras at tefillah right, when right. you become a bar mitzvah. You can't, because then you start messing up with, with, <laughs> with Yiddish kai. You right. can't change the Masorah. But when they're little mm -hmm. and they're first introducing themselves, they do it when they're little, 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 little. But as you get older, the more they're singing, the more it's less where it's enough, the more it's participatory, the more it is an experience where people are pumped about. Yeah the more it'll get into their heads, this stuff really matters. As they get older, that's when you start bringing in the, the, the reasons and right, the, and the right, power right. and the power. And, and there's like, again, I'm a Sephardi, so like it's different for us. Like you look at a Sephardi sitter, like they're like, again, you can't, they're like Shemus Hashem in everything. Like, yeah. and, and they show you them. And yeah, you're like, yeah. it's so cool that like these four, like you, there's all these you rut zones everywhere. Like it's a different experience. Yeah, like yeah. you see it so clearly. So the tefila needs to be such a primary focus when mm. the kids are little, because it's the thing you do the most. And if you get it early on and you love it, it's hard to not love it. Right. Right. That's true. Yeah. I guess we'll two, look at it two ways. Number one, just in general with teens. I mean, obviously, ideally, if they've already had that great experience, great. But in terms of with teens, what would you say to do with teens to help them have a better, more positive experience? Teens, I think, are also in, in understanding it. Just got to go like in a minute, if that's okay. Sure, sure, sure. Um, teens, teens, I find to be need a lot more understanding. It's amazing how teens will do stuff that they, they understand, but they don't, teens won't do anything they don't have, yeah. right? They'll go keto, never eat a carb and run around the lake 40 times. If someone tells them it's going to help them build this muscle to become a ball player, right? right? Yeah. They'll study for 20 straight hours every day. If someone tells them they'll get into a better school, mm -hmm. right? The, teens aren't like, you know, out to lunch. 
they're just not playing the game. Mm-hmm. They don't do things because you want it. Right. The level of understanding, and it's hard for people, by the way, because a lot of people don't even know how to explain it because they themselves don't really know it. Right, right. That's a good even point. if you're a rabbi. Yeah, right? that's a like, good point. The ability to really get with a teen and get underneath why we say things and what you're supposed to be thinking and yeah. how you can make your Shmona Esri super, exp- and by the way, this happens in Kiev all the time they do it. Why can't they do it for teenage? Why can't from kids get with half the kids get in, <laughs> K- in Kiev, right? Like, so true. Know, I don't know. You go to like a really good, you know, Kiev program and they're talking about tefillah. They're doing a great job. Yeah. They really are. And like you go to like a regular, I'm not saying, I'm sure schools are great. but like No, some I mean, it's very true. I, I was, when I was in Israel this year for Israel Guidance and I, I met with, with Aish and I was telling them that, you know, it, we need in, in the, the, the American high schools, all, every single high school, we need what Aish offers, you know, and the discovery seminar and all those things like though, that, those, those care yeah. of components, we like, sure. we need it and we don't necessarily, we don't have it enough. And it's, uh, it's really sure. lacking. Very true. We think that if someone does it, then they've gotten it. And it's not true. Yeah. It's not the long game. That's the short game. Yeah. Right. Just because a kid does, it doesn't mean they have it. It means they're doing it because they have to do it. It's very true. Right? If you really want to measure your success, don't look at a kid while he's in your institution. Look at the kid when he's out of your institution. Right. Right. That's the whole the first, the first part of the whole right there. That's exactly right. what it says. Right? That's the whole, you said with why it's called, they're called anacles, mm. right? Where's anacle come from? It comes from the, the burning bush. Right. How do you know something's eternal when it went, because that's where it comes from. It doesn't burn. So why is an anacle eternal? Why is it inconsumable? Mm. Because the kids may do it because they're wow. in your employ. Never heard But your that. grandkids won't because your grandkids come from your kids. So you know what kind of parent you are? You can only tell when your p- grand- kids have wow. kids. Mm. So Love you them. only become eternal when you're, not when you pass it one generation, when you see it being passed two generations. Wow, 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 right? wow. And when, but when they play that way, if people play, if high schools play to after college and parents pay to when their kids have kids, if we're always playing the long game, we make different decisions. Mm. We make totally different decisions. So true. Wow. Amazing. Okay. Well, I know you need to go. So I want to say yeah, I got 12 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for oh, your, all these Thanks incredible, the incredible insights. And uh, really, it was, a, it was a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Have a great day.